Hi there, my name is Cyrus and I am from PAN, the Physicians Association for Nutrition. Welcome to the third edition of our study telegram, where we bring you close to the latest, the most interesting and the most groundbreaking scientific publications in evidence-based clinical nutrition. This is part two of a three-part series in which we take a deep dive into the broad study, a landmark publication in the field of weight loss. In the first video, we looked in detail at the study's scientific background and the global importance of the weight loss topic. If you haven't watched this video, I encourage you to go back and do so. Otherwise, let's find out how the study was actually conducted by looking at the subjects and methods. The researchers set up a prospective two-arm parallel superiority study initially for six months and compared standard medical care as the control group with standard medical care plus a diet change program as the intervention group. They randomized participants, but blinding wasn't feasible as the researchers who performed the measurements were aware of allocation and of course participants were aware of whether they changed their diet or not. Patient recruitment took place at a group general practice in Gisborne, the region with New Zealand's highest rates of socioeconomic deprivation, obesity and type 2 diabetes. This seems to be a quite appropriate and representative setting for this kind of a study, as about 70% of the world's population live in either poor or low income situations, and only about 30% in middle, upper middle or high income situations. Inclusion criteria were age 35 to 70 and either obese or overweight with a diagnosis of one of type 2 diabetes, ischemic heart disease or the cardiovascular risk factors of hypertension or hypercholesterolemia. Looking at the patient's baseline characteristics, we can see that they were either close to or within the diagnostic criteria for metabolic syndrome. Exclusion criteria were life-threatening comorbidities, thyroid disease, severe cardiological or mental health issues, substance abuse, pregnancy or breastfeeding, prior bariatric surgery, and conditions that directly affected weight such as cancer. After checking patient eligibility and availability, 65 patients were randomized and enrolled in the trial groups. Okay, now after going through this enrollment process, what did the patients actually do in the study? They followed a plant-based diet, specifically a low-fat version with 7-15% to total energy from dietary fat, as this has been shown with previous research to achieve optimal outcomes, especially for heart disease and weight loss. This dietary approach included whole grains, legumes, vegetables and fruits. And participants were advised to eat until satiation from these food groups. No restriction on total energy intake was in place. Participants were asked to not count calories. Instead, they were given this traffic light diet chart outlining which foods to consume, limit or avoid. They were encouraged to eat starches such as potatoes, sweet potato, bread, cereals and pasta to satisfy their appetite and were asked to avoid refined oils such as olive oil or coconut oil and animal products such as meat, fish, eggs and dairy products. The researchers discouraged high fat plant foods such as nuts and avocados and highly processed foods and encouraged participants to minimize sugar, salt and caffeinated beverages. The diet was supplemented with a dose of 50 micrograms of vitamin B12 daily in the form of methylcobalamin. During the 12-week intervention time, participants of the intervention group attended two-hour evening sessions twice weekly in order to learn about their new diet. What did the participants do during those sessions? They mainly took part in cooking classes and were informed about the principles of healthy nutrition. Some special events during this time included informative movie screenings, discussions, restaurant meals, quiz night, potlucks, and a graduation ceremony after finishing the 12 week program. So basically the participants learned what foods to eat, why to eat them and how to prepare them all combined with social interaction in a community. Now let's find out what results this 
protocol yielded. To best understand the results, we should keep in mind that the intervention period with dietary instructions only lasted for the first three months of the trial. After that, the participants were on their own and just came back for follow-up measurements. For both the intervention and the control group, these took place after three and six months, and for the intervention group, due to the success they had, also after 12 months. Without further ado, let's take a look at what happened, and we first start with the control group. After three months, they saw a slight drop in total cholesterol, and after three and six months, the same for LDL cholesterol. On the other hand, their hemoglobin A1c had slightly increased at both three and six months. Furthermore, at six months, they saw improvements in physical well-being, self-esteem, and dietary indiscretions, meaning that what they were eating was more in line with what they thought they should be eating. And they spent a little less money on food. Lastly, after three and six months, they reported better nutritional self-efficacy. However, there were no significant changes for either body weight, BMI, or waist circumference. So, not a lot went on in the control group that was statistically significant, meaning that it did not only happen randomly or just by chance. And also the changes that did occur were quite small and are easily explained by two phenomena. Firstly, the Haythorn effect, which describes that participants might change their behavior just because they're being observed in a trial. And secondly, in this study specifically, during informed consent, the principles of a whole food plant-based diet were explained to all participants, including the control group. So they might have taken this information and slightly adapted the diet accordingly. Now on to the intervention group, where as a matter of fact, quite a lot of things changed. After three months, their BMI dropped by around three points, translating to a weight loss of more than eight kilograms. Now what's really interesting here is that after the 12-week dietary intervention had ended, they kept on losing weight and even kept the weight off at the one-year mark, reducing their BMI by more than 4 points and their weight by around 12 kilograms in the process, even though they had been on their own without dietary advice for 9 months. Their total cholesterol also slightly improved, with LDL dropping a little more than HDL cholesterol. Their waist circumference shrunk by about 10 centimeters, and their hemoglobin A1c improved as well. Their creatinine levels also came down a little, which is most likely explained by the fact that they didn't eat any meat or fish. Not only did these clinical measures improve though, but the participants also experienced more physical and mental well-being less dietary indiscretions, and elevated general and nutritional self-efficacy. Another highly relevant information to consider is that these major dietary changes did not coincide with less food enjoyment or higher food costs, and the health benefits were in fact not linked to increased exercise. What's also important is that no serious harms relating to the intervention were reported. One intervention participant with a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes reported hypoglycemia from week 1 consuming the whole food plant-based diet and his general practitioner reduced and then later stopped his insulin. As a matter of fact, for the intervention group, two people with diabetes no longer met diagnostic criteria at both 6 and 12 months, practically reversing their type 2 diabetes. Two intervention participants developed a low serum B12, which normalized with supplementation. And unfortunately, at month 5, one participant suffering from cholecystitis had to undergo cholecystectomy. Now, there is one more noteworthy result that should be mentioned. Because of the significant differences between the intervention and the control group at the 6-month endpoint, the researchers felt obliged to offer the intervention to the control group as well, and 11 participants accepted. Luckily, the authors also obtained ethics approval to extend follow-up to three years total, so we can hopefully expect new data soon. But luckily, you don't have to wait for the new data to get new, fascinating information. If you're interested in finding out how these study results compare to other weight loss trials, 
how the information might be utilized medically and what substantial contribution it might make on a global scale, feel free to subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you don't miss the last part of our three-part series on the Broad Study.